Hello and welcome to Evidence for Faith. I am so glad you're joining me today as we continue our study on David's Guide to Leadership. This is lesson number six. It's entitled, Be Rich, Be a Friend. We're going to be looking at 1 Samuel chapter 23 primarily today. We'll be looking at a couple of other verses too, but that is going to be um, our, our primary text is 1 Samuel 23 as we continue to look at massively important skills about leadership. And not just leadership, this is just good information for anybody, any Christian, to be able to have also um, about friendship and being rich. And I'm not talking about rich in wealth. But let's begin by asking God to bless us and open up our hearts and our minds. Dear Father, we do come before you and ask that your Holy Spirit, Lord, teach us. Thank you for all those who are joining me today in this lesson. And I pray, oh God, that you know the needs and the, the uh, the minds of the people who are listening, and I pray that you use this, that your Holy Spirit uses this lesson and uh, and teaches them uh, something that will really deepen their relationship and help them as they grow. And that is our request and our prayer, dear God, and we ask this in the name of Jesus and for his glory. Amen. You know, out of the, the furnaces of war come many true stories of sacrificial friendship. This lesson is about friendship. One such story tells of two friends back in World War I who were inseparable. They had enlisted together. They trained together. They were shipped overseas together. They even fought side by side together in the trenches. During an attack, one of the men was critically wounded in a field filled with barbed wire obstacles, and he was unable to crawl back to his foxhole. A, the entire area was under withering enemy crossfire, and it was suicidal to try and reach him. Yet, his friend decided to try. But before he could get out of his own trench, his sergeant grabbed him and yanked him back inside and ordered him not to go. The sergeant yelled, it's too late. You can't do him any good. You only get yourself killed. A few minutes later, the officer turned his back, and instantly the man was gone after his friend. After a few minutes, he staggered back, mortally wounded himself with his friend, who was now dead in his arms. The sergeant was both angry and deeply moved. He blurted out, what a waste. He's dead and you're dying. It just wasn't worth it. With almost his last breath, the dying man replied, oh, yes, it was, Sarge. When I got to him, the only thing he said was, I knew you'd come, Jim. You know, one of the true marks of a friend is that he is there when there is every reason for him not to be there. When to be there is sacrificially costly. You know, Proverbs chapter 17, verse 17 says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Mm -hmm. So true. Well, in our last lesson, we saw David faking insanity, lying, running away in some aspects from God. He definitely had walked away from God. And uh, we, we found him, or we left him in a cave full of a bunch of malcontents. So now David, yeah, that's true. He's, he's, in, um, he's now got a group of malcontents, and he's going to tool them into an army that eventually become the army of God who would conquer Palestine. And we have seen how David, though he was an insignificant other, rose quickly through the ranks to command. He was even made commander of Saul's army before Saul, full of his jealousy, ran him off. And we left David, as I said, in a cave somewhere in the Judean wilderness with his brothers and his father coming to his aid, as well as 400 malcontents. That's how the last lesson ended. Well, through the Psalms that he wrote at this time, we know he has humbled himself before God and is now seeking God's help in his life. Uh, though Saul is still hounding him, he nonetheless seeks God's advice. In chapter 22, verse 5, we read that God even sent the prophet Gad to aid David. In chapter 23 opens, we read more examples of David seeking God's will. Let's start off here with 1 Samuel chapter 23, verses 1 through 9. This is out of the English Standard. Now they told David, Behold, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah. 
and are robbing the threshing floors. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go down and attack the Philistines? And the Lord said to David, Go and attack the Philistines and save Keilah. But David's men said to him, Behold, we're, we're afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we go to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord again. And the Lord answered him, Arise and go to Keilah, for I will give the Philistines into your hands. And David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their livestock and struck them with a great blow. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. When Abathar, the son of Ahimelech, had fled to David to Keilah, he had come down with an ephod in his hand. Now it was told Saul that David had come to Keilah. Saul said, God has given him into my hand, for he shut himself in by entering a city that has gates and bars. And Saul summoned all the people to war, to go to Keilah, to besiege David and his men. David knew that Saul was plotting harm against him, and he said to Abathar, the priest, bring the ephod here. Now, did you catch how David's acting now as opposed to the last lesson? In verse 2, David asks God, shall I go? In verse 4, we read again, David inquiring at God. And then this ended, this last verse I said, ended with the words, bring, David saying, and ordering, bring the ephod here. That was an instrument used to determine God's will. But I want you to notice something else. Remember, this is, these men are all hiding in a cave. Did you notice something similar about these occasions? They're all being done. David's doing all this before the 400 men with him. David's, there's no mention of David going off by himself into a bedroom closet or whatever, uh, or over away from everybody else asking for God's direction. He's out in front of them, it appears, where a leader should be. In other words, he is leading. He's making an example to his followers. And we know from some of the biographies that the Bible gives us of these individuals, these followers of his, they too had a close walk with God. Men like, for instance, Uriah the Hittite, who was not even a Jew. He's a Hittite from the land of like Turkey. He becomes a follower of David and God's own heart. David had other foreigners among his mavericks. In 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 18, we can see this very clearly. It's talking about David and his, his army, and it says, And all of his servants passed by him, all the Carathites and all the Pelathites and all the 600 Gittites who had followed him from Gath passed on before the king. Now, who are the uh, Carathites and uh, who are the, the Pelathites? Well, scholars and, um, believe that, the, and there's a lot of evidence to suggest this, that the Carathites were actually a clan of Philistines that possibly came um, first from the island nation of Crete. Yes, these people, because it's a clan of the Philistines, were enemies of Israel, yet they joined David. The Pelethites, that one's a little bit more of a mystery. Scholars can't totally agree on this one, but many scholars believe them to be either a tribe of Philistines or some other like Arab nation that was destroyed. These were the surviving warriors that joined David together with the Carathites, and as you keep reading through Scripture, they become David's personal bodyguard under the leadership of a Levite named Benaniah. Who are the Gittites that were mentioned? Get this one. The Gittites were warriors from Gath. Gath, the same city where Goliath came from, and where David had fled earlier, pretending to be insane and stuff. 600 warriors from that large city came and joined David's army. Now, who guided, or shall I say, who disciplined all these men? David, of course. David is being a true leader. He is living the example he wanted them to follow. Seek God's guidance before you leap into a decision or an action. There's your lesson. Seek God's guidance before you leap into a decision or an action. And you don't have to go off and do this by yourself. David did this in front of his men frequently. Leaders, take a look at how you lead. Do you seek God's guidance in front of your followers? Or do you pray for or with your team? 
true in some places in the United States, doing this in the workforce might get you in a lot of trouble, like getting fired or even being sued by the ACLU. But you can still seek his guidance. My challenge to leaders is to try to do this publicly, to set an example for your followers. They see you doing this, they're more tempted to do the same then. Now, besides humbling himself and seeking God now, David has something else that helped him at this time in his life. As he's down living in this cave with these malcontents, you'll recall that his family and brothers came to encourage him. Now, there's an old saying, I'm sure you heard, nothing is as close as two brothers. And I'll say that in my life, that was true. My big brother, Alan, who's now with the Lord, he, he was one of my closest friends. I do admit that I, I know that some families, this is far from the truth. Brothers are, can't stand each other. But I, I think in David's case, at, at this time in their lives, David's brothers, who we know were not big fans of his at the beginning, have now sort of joined on with him, have become a great encouragement to him. But someone else comes to strengthen David. It's his best friend, Jonathan. Yes, Prince Jonathan seeks him out. Um, going back to 1 Samuel 23, look at verses 14 through 18 now. And David remained in the stronghold of the wilderness, in the hill country of the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul brought him, sought him every day, but God did not give him into his hands. David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life. David was in the wilderness of Ziph at Horesh. And Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David at Horesh and strengthened his hand in God. And he said to him, Do not fear, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Saul my father knows this. And the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. David remained at Horesh, and Jonathan went home. What? a moving example of friendship. Did you see why Jonathan sought him out? Did you catch it? It was to strengthen David in his relationship with God. He knew that David had been going through some tough things lately, and he, the prince of Israel, the, the person who's next in line for succession to be the next king um, by by bloodline, seeks out David to encourage him and swear his allegiance to David. That is friendship. My father had many sayings. He had a lot of weird sayings. Um, but one that he had was, if you have one person in this world you can call a close friend, then you're rich. I do believe that true friends are more valuable than silver, gold, land, real estate, cars, jobs, etc. Do you have one person, at least one person in your life that you can call a close friend? If you are, you're rich. Maybe you've heard of that expression of leadership that claims, well, leadership is lonely at the top. Now, I'm sure that is true, particularly in the secular world, but it doesn't have to be, and it surely should not be true in the Christian uh, worldview. Leaders need a friend or friends to help them too to strengthen them, to give them advice. I know some people think that leadership, you don't seek advice. David is constantly seeking advice. If you are a leader and are shutting yourself off from others, take some advice from David. He had close friends and brothers to help him. Jonathan came, and did you notice that Jonathan does not get on David's case about living in the land of the Philistines? He doesn't chew him out for faking insanity or reprimand him for lying. He did. There's no mention of Jonathan even talking about this. That's a true friend. Just prior to this, in chapter 20, we find Jonathan actually defending David against his own father, Saul. And Saul ends up uh, throwing a spear to kill his own son, Jonathan. This is in 1 Samuel chapter 20, verses 30 through 34. Let me read you this. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan, and he said to him, you son of a perverse, rebellious woman, do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lives on earth, neither you nor your kingdom shall be established. Therefore, send and bring him to me, for he shall surely die. Then Jonathan answered his father, why should he be put to death? What has he done? 
But Saul hurled his spear at him to strike him. So Jonathan knew that his father was determined to put David to death. And Jonathan rose from the table in fierce anger, ate no more food the second day of the month, for he was grieved for David because his father had disgraced him. Wow, what an unselfish and humble friend Jonathan was to David. Jonathan, who I mentioned, he was next in line to be the king. But unlike politicians today who are totally ravenous in their quest for power, and some position, and some people who are in just authoritative positions, they will walk over others, they, they will insult others, they just are so bent on, on power, being power hungry. But not Jonathan. Jonathan is willing and happy to stand aside to let his best friend be the new king. That is humility. He wants to help David keep his relationship with God going strong. I'm telling you, that is a leader. Look at some of the qualities just that are mentioned here about Jonathan. One, he, he's not power hungry. Two, he's, he's not seeking a promotion or gain for himself. Three, he's, he's looking for God's will. Four, he's willing to sacrifice himself for his friend. Five, he's willing to take a subordinate role to further the goal. Six, he can see who has the best qualities for leadership and not stand in the way. I really admire that in him. Number seven, he, he's not prideful about his abilities. If you recall, Jonathan and his armor bearer single-handedly defeated an army of the Philistines in 1 Samuel 14. He stands aside yet and lets David. No one, he didn't come home to people singing songs and stuff that much about him. And he's not jealous of David. Eight, he can stand aside and let another stand in front of the crowd. Nine, he's willing to do more menial work than is expected of his position. Ten, he's not impressed with having a certain title. In other words, he doesn't need to have a crown on his head. He doesn't need to have stationery with his name and title published on it. He doesn't have to have his name and title hanging on his door in his palace. Um, he doesn't have to have new shirts or jackets made with his title published on them. And finally, Jonathan is a true friend. So I challenge you, examine your, your life, the way you work. Are you a true leader? Look again at what that list was above here that I just mentioned. Those qualifications that Jonathan had as a true leader. And remember this, David had all of those too, and even more. I hope and pray that you all have a close friend. Someone who's going to accept you as you are. Who will be honest and humble with you. Someone who will freely give of themselves to you. Someone who will encourage you in your faith and your walk in God. Someone who is not easily offended. Someone who will cry with you, laugh with you, and listen to you. Someone who will voluntarily put themselves aside for you. And more importantly, I hope you are a person that does that all for someone else. We all need a close friend, especially leaders. Have you ever really read a lot of classics and having to do with friendship? When you really have a close friend, you disregard personal sacrifice. I don't know if you've ever read Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities, but there's a classic illustration in there. Um, it's uh, actually from John 15, 13. And in fact, Dickens actually quotes that in this book. Let me tell you, if you haven't read the book, or if you have, let me just remind you a little bit about it. But if you haven't read it, it's a fantastic book. But there's, there's a part of this whole story, there's two people who become very good friends, close friends, very, very close friends. One is named Charles Darnier, and the other one is Sid, uh, Sidney Carton. Now, Darnier, you probably guessed why his name is a young Frenchman. Eventually, he gets thrown in a dungeon and faces the guillotine the next morning. Uh, Sidney Carton is a lawyer, come upon bad times. He's a wasted lawyer. He, he has basically finished his life, as it were, as a loose living individual as there was found anywhere in England. Well, Carton hears of Darnay's imprisonment. And through a chain of events in this book, he gets into the dungeon and he changes garments with Darnay 
who then escapes. The next morning, Sidney Carton, impersonating Darnier, makes his way up the steps that lead to the guillotine. And Dickens says, as he writes of this, quote, greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for a friend, unquote. That's a classic example of ultimate in friendship. Father God, we thank you for this time we've had, and I just pray that you help us not to realize that we need a friend alone, but we need to be a friend to others, not to be power hungry, not to lord over someone. Be a good listener. And Lord, help guide someone in their relationship with you. I pray for everyone who's listening and that your spirit, Lord, will, will teach them through this. will take some of what you've given me to speak on, and, and Lord, it will apply to their lives. And I thank you for the blessings that you give, how Jesus is the closest friend we can ever have. Thank you so much. And in his name and for his glory, we pray. Amen. I want to thank you again for joining me today in this lesson and uh, continue to, to listen with us. We have a few more of these to go. Love to hear from you. Please go to evidenceforfaith.org. Uh, um, you can contact us there. And we have many other lessons and we solicit your prayers. And we are a, a ministry that works totally by donation. So um, if God puts upon your heart to help us there so that we continue can continue doing these and, and going out to places uh, because we, we offer our services for free. Um, we're just praying that God supplies it. And maybe he'll use you for that. If not, your prayers are also uh, greatly coveted. We want that also. And we just thank you so much for joining us. So until we meet again, take care and may God bless. Thanks for tuning in, and thank you to our donors who make this program possible. Evidence for Faith is a 501c3 nonprofit ministry based in the USA. You can support this broadcast by donating online using the links in the description. And don't forget to leave us a comment, a review, likes, and shares to feed the algorithm and help others find this content. Thanks again, and we'll see you on the next episode.